Colossians chapter number 3. Going to begin reading verse number 12. The Bible says, Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. We'll stop there. All the ladies can shout because verse number 18 starts, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. But verse number 12 through 17, the Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Colossia, tells them, verse number 12, there's a decision to be made. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearance, because he says forbearing one another, forgiveness and then verse number 14 he says put on charity that put on you find is the same terminology that he used when he told him to put on the whole armor of God those things exist you must choose to equip them in your Christian life now brother Randy one of them is in patience but that's one of the fruit of the spirit so you can't get away from that one either but that's an inside joke you'd have to been back in the teens class Sunday school when Brother Randy taught it. But he says, put on, therefore, as the elect of God. The elect in that verse is not, as the Calvinists would tell you, that you were chosen as one of the elect, and that's why you're able to be saved. Because there are those that are elect or chosen for salvation, and there are those that are predestined to go to hell. Hogwash. What he says is put on, therefore, as the elect of God, meaning those that God highly esteems, those that God values. The elect are the elect because they've been received of Christ because they received Christ. Right? They are the elect of God, not because God chose them beforehand, but God said, as you know, all those that come to Christ right, shall be transformed into the image of His Son. Who does God approve of? Jesus. So why are the elect of God elect? Because one of these days, they're going to look like Jesus. Here on this earth, they're robed in His righteousness. So when the Father looks at them, He sees Jesus. That's why they're the elect of God. But the Apostle Paul is saying, God thinks highly of you, so think highly of yourselves. Right? You've been given a name, you've been given a title, you've been given a home. And as a result, we ought to desire to look like what God expects us to be. You can't be that without putting on these traits. He talks, you know, bowels of mercy. Okay? God was merciful towards us. We ought to be merciful towards others. Right? He says kindness, humbleness of mind. Okay? You'll never be anything until you lower yourself before God, and then God will exalt you in due time. But humbleness of mind. Right? Where's the war waged when it comes to pride in your mind? Without a humble mind, you won't have a humble heart, you won't have a humble spirit, you won't have a humble lifestyle. It all starts with a humble mindset. And he goes on to say, meekness. Now the Lord was meek, but he was also very unassuming. The world said that he, was of, he looked as if he was of no reputation. There was nothing about the Lord Jesus from appearance-wise that you would think he was anything different than anybody else. He looked like the common man. Because who did he come for? All men. The common man. Right? He looked as if he was of no reputation. There was nothing to distinguish him from anyone else except his words, his walk, his lifestyle that he lived before man. That's what distinguished the Lord Jesus Christ in the world. 
It wasn't that he came looking like the king that we see when we get to the book of Revelation, where he, you know his face was as bronze, he had hair that was you know white as snow, white as wool, right? Eyes of flaming fire. That wasn't the form that Jesus took when he came to this world. He looked just like everybody else. What set him apart was what was inside of him. He put on a robe of flesh and for a moment set aside his deity, his, you know, on the Mount of Transfiguration, he let things back for about a half a second and it blew Peter, James, and John's mind. Right? That's not how he came the first time. He came, he looked just like everybody else on the outside. What set him apart? The things that were on the inside. One of those things, humbleness and meekness. Even though he was meek, he didn't let people walk all over him. I mean, his very words had enough power that when they came to arrest him, they said, are you him? He said, I am. And they all fell down because he admitted that he was Jesus, the Son of God. Right? Who did he tell Moses he was at the burning bush? I am that I am. He said, I am. And they all fell down. Knocked back at the very power of his words. Right? What set Jesus apart? The things that he said, one, who he was, but... The things that he said, the way that he lived, the miracles that he did, the works that he performed, all of that's what set him apart because everybody else said, Isn't this not a carpenter's son? Isn't this just a nobody? And even in that meekness, didn't let people walk all over him. He made a three quartered whip and drove the money changers out of the house of God. Meekness is not an invitation for people to walk all over you. Meekness is best summed up this way speak softly and carry a big stick as Teddy Roosevelt would have said right Benaya one of our pastor's heroes of the Bible hallelujah he did not name me after Benaya okay I still can't spell Benaya let alone doing it at seven years old okay or in kindergarten right but Benaya very meek man well how do you know that because he went down to an Egyptian and plucked the spear out of his hand and slew him with it Right? It's not about being armed to the teeth and letting everybody else know it. It's about living your life at peace with God and peace with others. But if the occasion calls for it, you know how to settle business. That's meekness. That your existence is not an affront to those around you. That you live peaceably among all men, as it's also written in the New Testament. You don't go out looking to bite people's heads off. No, you look to show mercies and bowels of mercies, right? To show kindness and compassion towards other men. It says meekness, but then he goes on. Long suffering. We don't like that one. Right? We like casting judgment early and then trying to throw them into the death row and then the execution chair. But we do not suffer long with those that for whatever reason have become either a burden or a thorn in our flesh. We want to suffer little. But yet, the Bible teaches us that through suffering we become more acquainted with Christ. We become closer to Christ when we accept that we suffer for His namesake. We taught one time, when you accept and come to the fact that suffering is going to be a part of your life, and when you embrace it as something that will bring you closer to God, bring forth the power of God in your life, because I found that in, you know, my strength... Right, My weakness, his strength is made perfect. When you embrace suffering, you actually become closer to God because you are conformed more to the image of his son. But we're not teaching on any of this. We're just trying to get to what the actual thought is. But forbearing one another. What's forbearing? Well, long suffering is dealing with the suffering for a long time. Forbearing is when you take it upon yourself to make somebody else's burden your burden. You are bearing something for another. Does in forgiving one another. Forgiveness is not the words. Forgiveness is done in deed. Just as there are works meet for repentance, if you've forgiven somebody, you're going to live like you forgave them. It's not just done in word only. To forgive is to truly forget. What happened to your sins when they were forgiven? They were gone. So when we forgive men, how should we forgive? As if it never happened. 
God doesn't treat you like there are sins that are still out there that have your name on them. No, in God's eyes, you've never sinned if you've been saved. It's as if that you never sinned, never will again in the eyes of God. Well, how many times did God or Jesus tell Peter to forgive some, you know, forgive his own brother? He said, 70 times? He said, no, 70 times 7. In other words, you keep forgiving as long as they're truly repentant of what it is that they're asking you to forgive them of. Forgiveness has no limit on how many times it can be offered. Well, how do you know that, Brother Jordan? Because if we're faithful to confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. How many times will God forgive you of sin after you get saved? As many as you ask Him to forgive you, or ask Him to forgive you. There's no limit on the forgiveness of God. There ought not be a limit on the forgiveness of a Christian. He says, but if any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all things, put on charity. We taught on that. We don't have time to, if I get off on charity again, we're going to be here a while. We don't have time to be here. We still got to get a few verses down. But he says, but which is the bond of perfectness? The mark of a true Christian is that they not only show, but their life is a testament of charity. It is a bond of perfectness. What are they being bound to? Christ. You want to get as close to Jesus as you can possibly get? It don't take having so much of the you know, Bible memorized. It don't take so many punches on your Sunday school attendance card. It doesn't take you know, how many tracks you've handed out. You want to get real close to Jesus? Start living charity. Because that's about as close as you can get to Him. And if you live charity, you're going to do all them other things too because you love Him. But true charity is what the world will mark you as a Christian. Verse number 15. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. You want to know why so many saved on their way to heaven, blood-bought, born-again Christians, you want to know why they're such a mess? Why they freak out at all the news? It's because the peace of God does not rule in their hearts. Something else does. You know what the peace of God is? Understanding that everything's okay in heaven and that the God that's in charge of heaven's also got you in his hand. That he feeds every sparrow. That he takes care of everything in this world. By him and through him do all things consist. It's only by his grace that he hadn't wiped the earth off of the face of existence yet. So if he's in charge of everything and everything's okay in heaven, the reason everything's a mess down here isn't because of God, it's because of man's sin and because of the curse of sin. So, knowing that everything's okay as long as God's in control, as long as you're in the perfect will of God, see last week's Sunday school message, you ought to be at peace that even if everything's upside down in your life, it's exactly as God wants it to be. And if it's exactly as God wants it to be, that peace that passeth all understanding can rule in your heart. It's not talking about peace in regards to man. It's talking about peace in regards between you and God. As long as everything's okay between you and the Father, there shouldn't be any problem. There shouldn't be anything that keeps you up at, you know, up at night, keeps you awake. Every now and then, you've got to cast all your cares upon Him. That, that You may lose some sleep doing that. But once you cast it, it's gone. Casting your cares upon Him is to unburden you so that you can be about the Father's business. Casting your cares on Him is so that the peace of God can rule in your heart. Not chaos, not uncertainty, not doubt, not worry. No, reassurance that you're exactly where God wants you to be. As long as you know that God's satisfied with everything in your life, you can face anything. It's the unknowing. Right? It's the uncertainty that causes the world and causes the devil to steal your peace. As long as peace rules, meaning it has the authority, it's the preeminent thing in your heart. As long as the peace of God is in control of your heart, all them other emotions are going to fall in line. Uh, but let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. But David said it best long before the Bible was even completed. 
Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. But so much more than that. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not forget your promises to me. Thy word have I hid in my heart that it can be an encouragement to me. Thy word have I hid in my heart so that not only I know right and wrong, but I can teach others right and wrong. You can't disciple if you've never learned. You can't raise children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord if you don't know what the Lord says is right and wrong. Right? You can't encourage somebody else when they're at their lowest unless you've got sweet words of encouragement from the Word of God. You don't have to quote them verses. But the Bible says that there's wisdom in counsel. But when you don't know what to do, when you've looked and there's no answer, who's the best place to get to? Somebody that knows more about the Bible than you do. Somebody that's been through a little bit so that they can be an encouragement to you. How do they do that? They've hid the Word of God in their hearts. But it says, let the Word of Christ dwell in you. You know what dwells? Something that's alive. We know that the Word of God's alive. But the question is, is it alive to you? There are some people that know things from the Bible because they've heard it a whole lot and a lot and a lot. But is it alive in your heart? Have you applied it? Right? Is it a part of you? Because if it's a part of you, you'll go out and live it. Because you know what things that are alive do? They bring about liveliness and other things. Dead things kill other things. Living things bring about life. He is life. So if he is life, and here's a little math equation for you. Sister Crystal, not in here, but here's a little bit of Bible math for you. If God, who is life, right, pinned down a word, which, according to John chapter number 1, when Jesus came, he was the word made flesh. So the word of God's just as much a part of God as anything else. So if his word is alive because he is alive, that means if you put it in you, you're going to act like you're alive and not dead. Right? It's real simple. Having a bad day? Get some Bible in you. Right? You don't feel like being compassionate or showing mercy or kindness to other people? Don't feel like showing charity? Get some more Bible in you. Because the Bible will remind you that you didn't deserve charity, but it's been shown to you. They may not deserve it. God had every reason to not show charity towards you. You fell short of the grace and the expectation of God. But yet God made a way that those that were below the expectation of God to be accepted and become the elect of God. Go see verse number 12. If you want to learn more about the elect. Right, but... Verse number 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. In other words, take the whole counsel of God to you. Right? Don't take what you think the Bible means. You want to find out what the Bible means? Read more of the Bible. Because God said it about eight different ways to eight different groups of people so that you'd have a way to understand it exactly the way that God wanted you to understand it best commentary on the Bible is not what somebody said about 400 years ago when they wrote the book. best commentary on the Bible is what the Bible says about the Bible. best teacher of the Bible is the Holy Ghost. Why? Because he wrote it. And you know how he'll explain it to you? The same way that he explained it to the person who wrote it down. God's no respecter of persons. If God let the Apostle Paul understand all of these things, he wants you to understand them too. The only mysteries, you'll find that word in the Bible, the mysteries that are still left are in the half that hadn't been told. You know why it hadn't been told yet? Because you don't need to know it yet. This is everything that you need. Because if you needed anything else, God would have put it in there. Yeah, but, verse number 17, And whatsoever ye do in word or in deed, I think that pretty much encompasses everything. Because in order to do something, you either got to say it or you got to do it. So he says, whatsoever you do, in word or deed, do all 
in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Well, that last part, giving thanks, means regardless of what you go through, you give thanks that the Father, either one, if it's a good experience, blessed you with a good experience, or if it's a bad experience, you thank God for giving, you know, picking you as the one that he chose to go through it. It's an opportunity for you to demonstrate what God's put on the inside outwardly. Every trial is a chance to pass with flying colors and let everybody see it. That's why I liked competi competition back in the day. About all them debate competitions that I went to. You know why I liked them? Because at the end of them, everybody had to sit down and they would put people up on stage and say, all right, these were the six that made it to the finals and then they'd count them down. And more times than not, I was the last one standing. You know why competition is enjoyable? Because everybody else has to sit down and admit he did the best today. But how do you know that? He's the only one left standing on stage right now and he got the biggest trophy. Right? It doesn't matter that I think I'm the best. It's when you get to prove it. Right? Well, Lord, I know all of these things, but I keep going through all these hardships. Yeah, it's because God wants you to show everybody else what he's put in you. Openly. And to give thanks while doing it. Right? To this day, I've got a big box full of all these trophies. I don't look at them anymore. Why? Because the only reason I wanted it was because everybody else wanted it. Right? I wanted to say, ha, I got it. You don't. Right? But some of the bigger ones are some of the more impressive ones. They're still sitting around collecting dust on shelves where people can see them. But what's the point of those things? It's proof that you passed it. But somebody else say, well, how'd you get through it? Well, you see this trophy? It doesn't have my name on it. It says Jesus on it. I made it through because of him. Right? I just get to hold this and point you to the one that actually did all the work. Right? See, that's a beautiful thing. All he promised was that if you were obedient, he'd take care of the rest. So when somebody says, well, how'd you get through that? How'd you overcome that? How'd you pass that test with flying colors? Well, it's not me. I just thank the Lord that he chose to choose me because it may have been too much for somebody else. I'm thankful that he found me faithful to let me go through it. Because he could have chose somebody else and they could have gotten all the blessings on the other side. Because every trial, as bad as it may be, it's worth it on the other side. You saying that everything turns out like Job? Where you get twice as much as you get on the other side? Well, sometimes. But sometimes you get to the other side and you get more of God. You get closer to God. You understand more fully right, God's will for your life. You understand more fully God's word for your life. And because of that understanding, you can go on and be a help to more people. You know, God uses greatly the ones that God tries greatly. You want to know why people pay so much for gold? Because it's been tried and found out to be real gold. It goes through a process of making sure that it's gold. If it isn't gold, it gets kicked to the curb. But if you pass all the tests, that's when it's got a high price tag on it. Nowadays, laboratory diamonds are so good that, you know, sometimes they can't even spot the difference. They won't tell you that. But depending on how good the person doing it is, as long as they didn't make it a funky color, right, you know, Oh, we found black diamonds. You found them or you made them? Oh, we've got blue diamonds. Sounds like a sapphire to me. I'll just go with the sapphire. It's cheaper. But they say, well, it passed all the tests. That's why you got to pay the big money for it. Because it met all of the C's in the categories. And because it met all of the C's, you got to pay stupid money to get it. Why? Because it's been proven. You know who God uses? Those that have been proven. Not because they deserve a claim, but because he knows that he can trust them. Because when the world sees them, they say, well, they've gone through enough to prove that they actually believe what they say they believe. But, 
back to the beginning of the verse, whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now see, in order to do something in the name of somebody else, you have to let others know who you're doing it for. You can't do things for a purpose and expect it to amount to anything if you don't publish the reason that you're doing it. But all the time, there are people who say, well, you know, like every time that a celebrity goes on to a game show, they always announce at the beginning, oh, no, I'm not going to take this money home. I'm going to donate it to this charity if I win. Why do they do that? Because if they don't tell nobody, money ain't getting to where it's supposed to get to. And they don't want to look like, well, they've got everything and they're winning prize money too. Right? But they probably got paid to be on the show, but they don't announce that. Okay? But no, all the prize money, it's going to this charity. Or every now and then, all the proceeds of this campaign are going to go towards this. What do they do? They do something in the name of something else. They don't want the credit. They don't want the glory. They don't want the money. They want it to go to something else. It has to be public. You don't get to do something in secret and then expect people to know it openly. Now, God sees those things done in secret and rewards them openly. But the world's not God. They don't see in your heart. They don't see in your mind. They don't know your intentions unless you make them public. So when it says, whatsoever you do, what's that mean? That means everything. And then to further clarify, he says, whether it's in word or in deed. That means not just the things that you labor with your hands for, not the things that you go out and actually work to do, even the things that you talk about. Even if you never lift a finger, but all you do is speak, and then it's done. Right? Because didn't the centurion that came to Jesus say, I understand that there's authority, and that words do have power? He says, I tell somebody to go do it, I know that it's done. He says, I believe if you just say, that my problem be taken care of, that you've got the authority that it's going to be done whether you show up or not. Right? Jesus said he hadn't found faith like that in all of Israel. Centurion, he is a Gentile. But yet he even understood that words carry a whole lot of weight if there's authority behind them. So when it says, whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now we've heard, because it's written this way in other parts of the Bible, that you're supposed to do all things as unto the Lord. But see, this is something on top of that. Do all things as unto the Lord means that you do it as if the Lord asked you to do it, and you do it as if the person inspecting the work is going to be the Lord. But see, here it says to do whatsoever you do, do it in the name of of the Lord. Do you buy groceries in the name of the Lord? Who gave you the money to do it? The Lord. Who gave you the convenience store to actually go and buy it from? The Lord. Because the Lord could have put you someplace where the nearest Walmart's two days away. When you go to the job, do you do it in the name of the Lord? Because, see, it's easy to say, well, I'm just going to do this as if the Lord asked me to do it. Well, if the Lord asked you to do it, if you're supposed to do all things as unto the Lord, if the Lord asked you to do it, there's a reason that He asked you to do it. And yes, part of it is so that you can have income to live off of. But He also wants you to do it in the name of the Lord. Now that means you go to work and you let everybody else know the reason I'm here today is because of Jesus. Now do you always have to say it in word? No. You don't have to start every conversation and saying, we're going to have this conversation in the name of the Lord. You don't have to do that. Because if your life is like from verse number 12 down through verse number 16 
people are going to know that you're of the Lord. But when it says everything you do, do in the name of the Lord, it's not just talking about the outward acknowledgement that, hey, I'm not doing this for me. I'm doing this for Him. It also means that you've got the unction to go and do it in the name of the Lord. You've got the authorization. See, I just can't go and say, hey, I'm here for the president. Can I have that without paying for it? I don't get the right to do that. I, if my car breaks down, I can't jump out in the middle of the road and say, stop, Boone County Sheriff's Department, give me your keys. I need that car. I can't do that. You know why I can't do that? Because I don't have a badge that says I'm a part of the Boone County Sheriff's Department. I don't have the uniform that says I'm a part of the Boone County Sheriff's Department. So the other person doesn't believe that I have the authority to do it. Do you realize that every second of every day you have the authority to act as an ambassador of heaven? Because God empowered you to do it and then he commanded you to do it. When you go out, it's not... Well, why do you believe that way? Because that's what Jesus said. It's not my authority. I believe it because the Bible says it. Or I believe it because God gave me a personal conviction about it. You know what both of those are based on? Not me. So if I live my life by that conviction, shouldn't I let other people know the reason that I'm doing it? Because what's good for the goose is good for the gander. A little leaven leaven it the whole lump. A little bit of good can spread to other people just as much as a little bit of bad can spread to other people. One pebble cast out in the middle of a lake is going to leave ripples all the way to the shore. So if it's important enough to God to put the burden in your, in your heart to live that way, why isn't it important enough to let other people know why it's important to you? Why isn't it important enough to give credit to the one that actually told you to do it? You've got the authorization to go out and say, Thus saith the Lord. You don't have to be a prophet. You don't have to be a preacher. You don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to be saved for 80 years in order to go out and tell other people, This is what the Bible says. You know what it takes to go out and say, This is what the Bible says? First, go see a couple of verses before this you got to have that relationship where the living word of God's in you you got to be saved you got to be studied because you can't go out and say thus saith if you don't know what he said okay but then all you got to do is you got to go out and speak it once you know what he said you're authorized to go tell other people what he said you're responsible if you do that to give them the whole counsel of the word of God you can't pick and choose and take it out of context no, you've got to present it as Christ presented it to you. But if He's shown it to you from the Word, you can go out and proclaim, this is what God said. It's perfectly okay with God for you to go out and say, hey, that dude that's saying that he's a chick, that don't fly. Not my opinion, that's what God said. And I agree with God, so yes, it is also my opinion, but that's not my authority. It's okay for you to go down to the school board and say, hey, this is what God has to say on this situation. It's okay for you to go to the boss and in a meek spirit, don't go trying to pick a fight, but in meekness to go and say, hey, I can't do this because that goes against what God says. I can't embrace this. I can't be a part of this because this is what God says. Well, Brother Jordan, that might make waves at work. It might make good waves. Not all waves are bad. If you're out in the middle of the ocean, the wave that takes you to shore is a good wave. It's not a bad wave. God's waves push you closer to God. The devil's waves try to sink you, capsize you, put you under. God's waves aren't to overtake you. They are to direct you. What are you saying? I'm saying go out and make some waves. Because it's one thing if you think that I'm just a prick 
and that I'm saying something to you to annoy you. Something completely different when you know that person to be a person of love, compassion, charity, kindness, long-suffering, meekness. And when they come to you and say, hey, because I care about you, I want you to know what God says about it. That hits a little bit different. On the authority of God, I'm letting you know that this is what God has to say about it. It's up to you what you do with what God said about it. But because I care about you, I want you to know what God said. Not what a politician says, not what a man says, not what mom, dad, grandma, grandpa said. I want you to know the truth. Because the truth brings you to the Son, because He's the way, the truth, and the life. And if the Son sets you free, you're free indeed. The Bible says that there'd be a famine for the hearing of the word in the last days. Well, I'm starting to think that there's also a famine for the telling of the word. Not of the preaching. There's still preachers that are going red in the face and preaching their lungs out every Sunday, Wednesday, or sometimes Thursday, depending on when churches have their midweek service. But there's still preachers doing what preachers have done. There's a famine for people going out and living it. Telling. Because you know what often is the case nowadays? You know the people that come to church save people. Used to save people brought lost people with them to church, but nowadays save people are the ones hearing the preaching. And because it doesn't impact them, the preacher never gets out to the world. Your life is meant to be a written epistle, known and read of all men. You know what that means? The way that you live, people know. Everybody around you is reading you all the time. They're not psychics. They're not pulling out tarot cards and saying, hmm, I believe that this is what this person's thinking right now. No, what you're thinking makes its way out in what you do. What's in your heart makes its way out your mouth is what the Bible teaches. Whatever's important to you, whatever you've let become a part of you, it's evident in your everyday life. But as you're doing it, people already know the way that you live. Well, if you live in the way that God says, why don't you just start giving God credit for it? You see, it's not just His authorization, it's also His acclaim. I am what I am by the grace of God. I've got the ability to get up out of bed today because God gave me enough grace to do it. I'm breathing oxygen because God didn't shut the oxygen off. We've got electricity because God at some point gave man... I don't believe that it was Benjamin Franklin flying a kite and then the electricity hit it and then the key had electricity in it. That don't make sense, okay? Keys cannot have electricity. They can have a charge to them, but it's not like the cartoons that they showed you in school, okay? But there were experiments. Benjamin Franklin was on the, the front edge. You had Tesla and Edison arguing over AC and DC and what in a band. That's different ways that current can go, all right? But God gave men the intellect to where we've got electricity. The only reason that electricity works isn't because Tesla and Edison and Benjamin Franklin were all geniuses and they figured it out. No, electricity works because God hasn't shut off the electrons and the, the particles that bounce around each other to give us electricity. Right? If man really figured electricity out, we could do it without wires. Okay? But, all that being said, God's the one that gave us the ability to be what we are. He equipped us to be what we are. He instructed us so that we would know what we're supposed to be. And then he commissioned you to go out and do it, not for your own acclaim, but to lift up the name of his darling son. Because Jesus said, and I, if I be lifted up, would draw all men unto me. What's our goal? To get the world's eyes off of me and to get it on him to get their eyes off of the world and to get them to look at the one who's altogether lovely to be an instrument for the Holy Ghost to draw them with cords of loving kindness to where they get to the point where they realize they're wrong, God's right and they need to agree with Him that they need to accept the only sacrifice that's going to cover their sin but then that they need to get involved the same way you are to be an ambassador 
to go out and go. There's a lot of people that live with thanksgiving in their heart. They're thankful for everything that God's given them. And that's, that's biblical. You ought to thank God for what God's given you. There's a lot of people that inwardly, they've got more of the Bible committed to not just a memory, but committed to their heart than a lot of the people that you'll see get up on TV or CDs and everything else telling you, you know, how much they know about the Bible. There's people that have lived it for longer than them people have been alive. They've got more Bible in them than just about anybody, which is biblical. There's people that have a desire to go out and do something for the Lord, which is biblical. But there's very few people going out and doing it in the name of the Lord Jesus. There's a whole lot of people going out there that have ministries attached to their work, but it's whatever their name is, ministries. There's a lot of people that are going out and giving out tracts so that they can say, so-and-so gave you a tract. No, Jesus gave them that tract. Use just the vehicle that delivered it. That as much as the mailman puts into the mailbox, he's not the reason you got the mail. Right? You got the mail because somebody put it in a mailbox and paid for the postage to get it to you. Okay, now I'm thankful he didn't lose it. I'm thankful he didn't steal it. Right? But the mailman's not the focus. You don't open up the letter and say, oh, this is a great letter that the mailman gave me today. No, you say, oh, that's a great letter that so-and-so sent to me. Right? So-and-so sent me a gift. You forget about the mailman right after he's gone. We're just the mailman. You see us all the time. We're nothing special. Right? Champ hadn't figured that out yet. He still barks at the mailman every time he sees him because he thinks he's evil. Right? Same thing with the UPS and the FedEx, and he really hates the Amazon people. Don't know why. But he hates them especially. But you'd think he sees them all the time. He should get used to them. Right? You get used to them. You get used to seeing school buses. What are they? They're just the vehicle that takes kids to and from school. Right? If the school bus was all that important, we wouldn't be talking about what's going on in schools. We'd be talking about what's going on in school buses. That we don't give any credit or acclaim to what happened in order for you to get it. We give a claim to the thing that started it all off, the person that's in it. You don't write a thank you card to the mailman for giving you the letter that somebody else sent to you. That's his job. That's what he's paid to do. Well, what's our job? Our job is just to be the mailman. We're just the carrier pigeon. Right? Nobody has ever written a thank you card to a, a messenger bird. You know why that bird did what it did? Because somebody trained it to do that. Somebody taught it to be a carrier pigeon. Who's the credit go to? To the one that sent the bird. Right? You don't write a letter back to the bird and say, thank you so much for what you did to me. No. So when the world sees it, they're used to us. We fade into the background. Right? They may see stamped on our life Jesus, but until they come face to face with Jesus, until they know that you're doing something for them in the name of the Lord Jesus, until they realize that it's... No, it's not just that I care about you. I do care about you, but there's somebody that cares about you a whole lot more. His name's Jesus. When you start attaching the name Jesus to what you're doing, the world takes note because they don't like that name. They got an issue with a whole lot of things, but there's one thing that they've always had an issue with, and it's Jesus. But when they realize that Jesus isn't against them, but he's for them, because he put somebody in their life that's for them, that's when business is about to pick up. But doing everything inwardly. Saying, well, it doesn't matter what other people know. All that matters is what's going on between me and Jesus. Well, if everything's right between you and Jesus, other people are going to know about it. Show me somebody that's perfect in the perfect will of God that other people don't know exactly what God thinks about them that are around that person. 
If you light a bonfire off, people are going to feel the heat. Right? On days like today, if it's raining, people are going to get wet. If God's moving in your life, people are going to know. But see, they cannot understand spiritual things. They're spiritually discerned. The flesh cannot understand it. They need somebody to tell them. Because they're not smart enough to figure it out on their own. This world's ever learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of truth. You need to let them know, this is God's grace. This is God's love. Don't give me credit for it. Thank the Lord. He's the one that told me to do it. Because when they understand that there's something bigger than you, it's also bigger than them. You saying everything you do, you got to stamp, I'm with Jesus on your forehead before you go out the door every day? No. But I'm telling you, when the Holy Ghost tells you to do something, let them know why you're doing it. As you live in your life, if somebody asks, why do you do things that way? Because Jesus said so. Because if he doesn't get the glory for it, if he doesn't get the credit for it, they're never going to understand that they need to come face to face with him. People can confront me all day long. I don't intimidate them. I intimidate some people, but they're usually a whole lot smaller than me. Right? On the outside, people say, mm, I don't want anything to do with that person. But if you open up what God's done inwardly, outwardly, man that shows himself friendly is going to have a lot of friends. Man that shows long suffering and mercy and kindness and they're meek, they're going to be able to reach a lot of people. It's not about what you have on the inside, it's about letting what he put in you out. And letting people know that this isn't of me. Taste and see that the Lord is good. He just gave me the fruit. I'm just here to give it to you. Because unless it's done in the name of the Lord, nobody's going to know that everything that you do has anything to do with God. It's all about associating what you do each and every day with the one that gave you the ability to do it, equipped you to do it, sent you out to do it. Because if I did work for the president and I showed up and said, hey, can I have that? They're going to expect me to pay. But if I do work for the president and I show up and I say, hey, I'm here to get that for the president, they're going to give it to me. Where's the proof in the pudding? What's the pudding every day of your life? Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.